Hi everybody and welcome to the Saturday Surface Interval. Now, I was brought up, if you don't have something nice to say about something, just don't say anything at all. But it seems that if we ever upload a choice of video titles, you guys always seem to choose a negative option. So we're talking about the worst dive gear in the world this week, it seems. Now, this is a part two video. Uh, there has been a part one video. I don't remember much about it. It was written and filmed a very, very long time ago. Um, you can watch that up here. Uh, but for now, here is five of the world's worst dive gear. As all of you probably know by now, one of my pet peeves is the dreaded flappy snag hazard. Hashtag flappy snag hazard. So when I see a BCD with more D-rings stitched onto it than gold chains around Mr. T's neck, I think to myself, what are they all for, honestly? When have you honestly had one thing clipped off to every single D-ring or needed a D-ring just an inch below another one on a shoulder strap? I get that it's trying to give you convenient options so that you can reach at least one, but at that level, I'd like to think that most divers could find a single D-ring without too much trouble on the shoulder strap. My BCD has, what, five D-rings on it, and that's including the two on the crotch strap. One on each shoulder and one on my hip. That's all you really need. Everything else should be in pockets. I mean, I even remember a weight belt once that had D-rings on it. And just take a moment to think about that. A weight belt with attachment points. What, what would you possibly want to attach to that? Something obviously that you didn't mind losing if you ever needed to ditch your lead in an emergency. But every D-ring on your kit is one more really secure snag hazard that you can get caught on something. And I've known one to get caught on a ladder getting out of the water and just rip a BCD beyond repair. If there are more D-rings on a BCD than members of the Mystery Gang, then it's just too many in my opinion. And I'm not counting Scrappy-Doo, he doesn't count, so five in total. I've done this. I'm humble enough to admit that I've used non-scuba diving gear whilst diving, uh, but I won't anymore. And there's honestly a reason why you shouldn't. The way that things are marketed today as like the best thing, the most amazing equipment, it would make sense that why should I buy two base layers, one for my hiking and one for my dry suit? It I should only need one and that could do work with both surely, right? Or this carabiner, it, is, it works really great whilst I'm rock climbing. Uh, it'll be really handy to take with me on a dive, but non-scuba diving gear is often not suitable for diving and you can damage it or hurt yourself if you use the wrong thing. But scuba diving gear has been specifically designed for scuba diving. Go figure, right? It, it will use marine grade materials, and it will have the needs and the complications of scuba diving taken into account during the research, the development, and the manufacturing. I know scuba gear tends to be a touch more expensive than the hiking equivalent, but there is a reason for it. The hiking thing, it isn't designed to be submerged in salt water for prolonged periods of time or deal with an increase in ambient pressure. A lot of those underwater camera housings where you can just pop any phone in or something, they're great when you're snorkeling on the surface, but when you dive down and the pressure pushes all of the buttons on your camera at the same time, it's not much use anymore. It's better if you invest in the proper scuba gear and then use it to go hiking or whatever. The worst I've ever heard of was using one of those chemical heating vests underneath a dry suit on a dive. The increase in the ambient pressure just supercharged the chemical reaction. Bad results. We live in a modern world where there's a cheaper copy of just about anything. That fancy mask that you're wearing, there's probably a much cheaper copy of it with a different logo stamped on it somewhere on the internet. But there's a reason why it's cheaper. Sure, it's the same kind of shape, but it's a little nasty held next to the real thing. They didn't clean up the edges around the skirt and the silicone isn't quite as nice. If you take the brand logos off both and you look at them side by side in front of you, you'd still notice the difference and nine times out of 10, you can still work out which is the more expensive option. If you can't, then fine, go nuts, fill your boots. But 
When that cheap torch from the other side of the world finally arrives eventually, claiming to be 1000 lumens on the box, and you turn it on next to your actual 1000 lumen torch, you're going to notice the difference. The same for regulators. When you look at regulators long enough, you'll start to notice that a lot of the first stages are very similar in design, but whilst on paper, or on the web page, whatever you're looking at, they have the same specs, they're both balanced, uh, they're both environmentally sealed, they have the same number of ports. What you don't get to compare is the quality of breathe. What you're paying for with fancier gear is the greater attention to detail and the little nuances inside that make a huge difference. You can backwards engineer a lot from a sample product and create your own, but you can't copy it exactly. And the copy is always going to be diminished returns. So in a lot of cases, it's better to get the real thing. Affectionately named suicide tanks, um, some BCDs and DSMBs, they're not so common anymore, but they come with small tanks for independent air sources to inflate them when needed. With a BCD, it was often on the back, just around your hip. Uh, with the DSMB, it's just attached to the bottom at the beginning of the dive. The intent made sense. It's a completely independent, isolated tank that is purely just for inflating your BCD or your DSMB. So if your back gas ever runs out or whatever, at least you can still control your buoyancy. I mean, sometimes I'll personally dive with a dedicated small pony tank just for my dry suit, so I'm not wasting my breathing gas to control my buoyancy or my insulation. But there's a reason why you don't tend to see very many of these suicide tanks anymore with small tanks built into a BCD or a DSMB uh, and, and why they're actually called suicide tanks. If you open that tank valve by accident in the water, you are gonna shoot up to the surface unless you can simultaneously dump gas and close the valve at the same time. Most of these systems, they, they don't have first stages. The tank just attaches directly to the BCD or to the DSMB. So you can open the cylinder valve and that's it. But poosh, up it goes. And it, it keeps going until it's empty, which even when you're using it correctly is quite scary. You just open up a tank valve underwater I'm waiting for it to empty. You're, you're literally letting a tank empty completely in the water, which if I think back to my original open water course, was a big no-no. And then your plan is to refill that tank for your second dive and use it again. A lot of these little tanks as well, they don't need to be tested periodically. They're, they're under a certain size where they need to be tested every year or two. So you have no idea what the state of the inside of that tank is, and you are right next to it when you're filling it up to 200 bar from your main tank. Hmm. Nah, you can keep that very far away from me. Thank you very much. If your BCD looks like the bad guy at the end of the last crusade after he chose poorly, it might be time for you to retire it. If you don't look after your gear, or even if you do, if, and you just hold on to it for too long, it is gonna degrade over time, and eventually it is going to fail. A bit of discoloring is okay. If your BCD was black when you first bought it, and now it's kind of a brownish gray because you've been diving in the sun a lot, then sure, that's kind of okay. But when it's best described as sun bleached, it's time to upgrade your gear. It served you well. You've got your money's worth out of it. Let it rest. Send it up to the dive center up in the countryside up north where it can run around with the other BCDs and chase rabbits and stuff. But regulators as well. I've seen my fair share of not really just classic vintage regulators, just old regulators still in circulation, still photographed in modern magazines and in online photos. You can almost carbon date them by the style of that front cover. We've been through that big circular chunk of plastic second stage phase where the only logo was on that tiny purge button on the front, the two part metal body second stage with that huge clamp around the circumference that you screw together that kind of paint splatter phase that we went through, you remember that? You can still find some of those on dive boats today. If your service tech kind of winces when you bring your gear in for a service, it's because there isn't a standard service kit anymore. So 
they're going to have to rifle through their drawer of just odd o-rings to try and find something that will work for it but upgrading your gear from time to time is okay modern regulators and bcds they really are quite nice you are worth treating yourself and getting yourself a new one so there were a few of my worst dive gear in the world, but what's the worst thing that you've ever dived with or seen on a dive? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to check out our merch store by clicking the banner underneath this video. Thank you for watching everybody and of course, safe diving.